mechanical formulation. It's meant to be a balancing test, a test that balances the interest in speech, which you have explained are very high, and the interest in protection, the integrity, protecting the integrity of the criminal process and the criminal proceeding, which is also a weighty constitutional interest. And so the reason I'm asking this question is to see if there's any balance, which is what the Supreme Court tells us to do, in the test that you propose. What? And so tell me how it, bal how it balances if you can't give me anything other than a criminal law violation that would satisfy your test. The phrase I believe that the Fifth Circuit used in Brown, a case heavily relied on the government, is absolute freedom. In the context of okay, a so there is campaign. no balance. Criminal speech obviously is subject to the, the restrictions. Then that's but core okay, political so speech that is core political speech that's part of campaign speech. That I don't know that, that, that I don't. I think that kind of calling labeling it core political speech begs the question of whether it is in fact political speech, or whether it is political speech aimed at derailing or corrupting the criminal justice process. You can't simply label it that and conclude your balancing test that way. We have to balance. Back with us, Andrew Weissman and Neil Katyal. And Neil, that word balance just kept coming up again and again, and that was the clearest demonstration of it. Uh, Judge Millett saying there has to be a balancing test between the First Amendment and protecting the integrity of the criminal process in a, in a criminal, the trial process in a criminal proceeding. How, how does the, how, how do you, how does constitutional scholarship balance these two things? And the First Amendment seems like it has much more weight than many other things in the Constitution. They don't all weigh the same when you're, when you're trying to balance them, right? Right. No, that's right. Um, uh, here's how constitutional scholars do it. They don't do what Donald Trump's lawyer said today. I mean, Trump's lawyer sounded like an anarchist First Amendment freak, like First Amendment over everything. Mm -hmm. That is not the law. It can't be the law for the reason that Judge Millett pointed out, which is, look, you know, we need to have fair trials. You can't just have a criminal defendant going and threatening witnesses, threatening the prosecution, threatening the judges and say, free speech, free speech. That's insane. And so you balance the two things. And sure, does, does free speech have an important role here? hundred percent. But it's not the only value. That's what she kept saying. Trump's lawyer never got it. I would say, however, I don't think the government quite picked up on this either. They got so into the theory and the hypotheticals, mm -hmm. they lost a little bit of just what this case is about. I mean, this case, Lawrence, is about a, a criminal defendant who has a history of threatening other people, including when in trials, and that's what the judge last week in Colorado found. It's a person who talks in double talk, so that it's a threats that sound, that if you take and if you just read the individual threat, it doesn't seem like a threat. You have to read it in context. And Trump always has some sort of, you know, explanation the way a mob boss does and how it's not actually a threat. So it's those two things. And then number three, we have a history of people listening to Trump's threats, whether it's on January 6th, whether it's the person who, you know, attacked Judge Cho, threatened Judge Chutkin, you know, there's a history of that. That history, all of that, all those facts were a little bit lost in the special counsel's argument today. Obviously, this is a phenomenal panel of judges. They know this stuff, but I was a little surprised by that. So, uh, Andrew, the, the threats got uh, weighed differently by these judges at certain points, depending on who you're threatening. So there was, yes. a, for example, the judge said, you know, I don't think uh, Bill Barr is going to change his testimony because he gets a threat from Donald Trump. One of the counters to that, which wasn't highly amplified, but was in, in the argument, uh, was the government saying, yes, but there are many other witnesses who are not public figures who were not attorney general of the United States, who were not generals, they, they, and they see these big, powerful witnesses getting threatened, and it has an impact on them. Absolutely. So the court, in trying to figure out the right test for this balancing that you were talking about with Neil, um, is floated this idea of does it depend on the status of the person being threatened as to whom yeah. it was being targeted and and used a principle which is what about a public figure it's sort of known in terms of libel law and defamation uh, and saying you know if it's a public figure whether it's Jack Smith Mark Milley uh, former Attorney General Barr is it really going to affect their the 
trial process for them. Um, isn't Jack Smith got, you know, uh, thick skin? Is Bill Barr really going to change his testimony? Is Mark Milley going to change his testimony? So they looked at it, and, and it, if you look at it from that narrow perspective in terms of the effect on the trial, um, the answer is probably no. There's probably not a likelihood that you could say that Mike Pence or any of those people is going to pull their punches. But I agree with you, and as somebody who's prepared witnesses, you're going to have lay witnesses who are you know, unknown people looking at this going, I don't want that to happen to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I do not want to be subject to that. I do not want to testify. I don't want to say anything that's going to be helpful to the government so I can just sort of avoid what I'm seeing happening to other people. Plus, you don't really know in advance, are you going to be considered a public person or not? So that test, I think, would be very problematic if the mm -hmm. court goes down that road. It'll be interesting to see whether they use it and how they deal with the problem that you were saying, which is, you know, that may not balance it sufficiently in terms of the trial process. And just to take one example, Lawrence, Cassidy Hutchinson, mm -hmm. not someone who has the highest ranking title or anything, obviously in the room where it happens, key witness. Mm -hmm. Does she qualify as a public figure or mm -hmm. not under the test that was being floated around today? I think it gets really mushy. Um, the court may go there, but I think there's some real problems. Right. So you, could, you could at the end of the day just say, like, every witness in the trial of a former president suddenly is a public official. Yeah. Um, because they are sort of in the spotlight and they're being called. And so that would sort of make the whole test go away. I mean, you just basically have everyone being subjected to this kind of harassment. I, I thought the, the indirect effects of this kind of threatening language was underplayed in the hearing, including by the judges. And for me, especially when it came to Jack Smith, when it came to Jack Smith, there seemed to be a general consensus among the judges that of course you can attack Jack Smith. Of course you can attack him. And of course prosecutors get attacked. But they usually get attacked within the courtroom, within the rules of evidence, with a judge there where the defense counsel is standing up and saying, you know, nasty things about prosecutor Andrew Weissman. That's a different environment from what we're talking about here. And to go to the indirect effects, if you are a potential juror, if you are a, you know, non-public figure witness, and you see the prosecutor attacked, which is something you've never seen before in your life. And you think, I'm not going to go in there and go into that jury pool. He attacks the prosecutor. Imagine what he'll do to me. Plus a million, Lawrence, to what you're saying. I think it's absolutely right. There's no way in which you as a juror is going to have the sophistication to understand, oh, Jack Smith, there's a special Jack Smith rule, right. but not for you right. and me. And so... You know, I do really worry about this test. And on the other side, I was a little surprised at the court today, at least in the questions. And, of course, the questions don't always tell us the full picture of all the judges are thinking. But it did seem like the judges had this view like, oh, you know, a presidential candidate has to be free to attack the prosecution. Mm -hmm. I mean, that isn't the way criminal trials work. You don't get to, like, go and mouth off about the prosecutors or witnesses or others outside the courtroom. As you say, you do it inside the courtroom. And I do worry one effect of this, if the court does have any sort of carve out for Jack Smith or whoever, is a corrosion in our norms around mm -hmm. trials. I mean, Donald Trump, every time he lost when he was president in court, he would blame a so-called judge or call them racist or this or that, you know, you know, nonsense. And that coarsens our society. And the American public's watching this trial. And he's going to do the same thing now here to these prosecutors. What's going to happen when the next Bob, mob boss is tried? What's going to happen when the next game person is trying. Yeah, that's why this is so far the most important pretrial hearing in a Trump case, because we are on the verge of making new law here, which is why we're going to squeeze in a commercial break. Uh, and we're going to come back to more of this very important day in court. We'll be right back with Andrew Weissman and Neil Katyal.